believer in James 1.1. 1, 1. This is our second lesson from this verse. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Last week, you'll recall that we introduced the subject matter looking at the author of the book. We will still continue to do that today and looking at the book itself uh, after a moment of prayer. This would be Introduction to James, part two. Let, we'll give it a chance. All right. Let's have a word of prayer. Every head bowed and every eye closed to offer privacy to the people around you as well as yourself. This is classroom etiquette. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. Spiritual. How is that possible? Well, I'm saved and indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes me spiritual. Spiritual. You have to be a spiritual person to understand this book. You have to be under the ministry of the Holy Spirit who teach you, guide you, instruct you. All the things that's necessary to bring the fulfillment of the Word of God actively and alive in our life in the church age. How is that? What do I have to battle with, Ron? Well, carnality. How do I know I, I'm a carnal believer? Personal sin. Identity of personal sin in your life. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be overt sins or sins of the tongue. The Holy Spirit will point it out. Your conscience will show you as well. And confession of that sin needs to be made. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is not a salvation passage. This is a sanctification passage. And that's what we're talking about. So I give you in a moment in your priesthood to confess sin so that the Holy Spirit can minister the truth of the Word of God today out of James 1.1. 1, 1. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way both by automobile and by Internet. For those, as Al mentioned, uh, in the Internet, we, we encourage you to show the same respect under the etiquette of study to stay away from distractions and to be able to concentrate where the Holy Spirit can have your undivided attention so that you're not always flopping around in double-mindedness to learn the Word of God. It can't be done. The single-mindedness of the Holy Spirit being able to teach us is the secret to spiritual growth momentum. And I pray for that for you as well as us here today, that this discipline for study is evident in your life, and it will be through growth. And so I pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. I got six points today in my introduction. In the first hour, Tony will be bringing our message in the second hour. Uh, but one of the things you should do when I introduce you to a book and I say, here's the book we're going to study, there are some simple things you should do on your own. For example, <clears throat> it just makes sense. I mean, who doesn't, you know, you're given, you, when you were in college, you went and got a book. You know, you had to go buy books. Um, the first thing I did was look at the size of the book, how many pages, and then how many chapters were in that thing. Then I wondered if I could get a cliff note version if that, no, if that number was high. Um, that's how I made it through school. I don't know about the rest of you. Well, one of the things I learned from doing that in how to study in college. They never taught me in high school, but when I got to college, I had professors my freshman year that taught me how to study <clears throat> because the whole secret was getting grades. Every once in a while, I have professors said, yeah, grades important, but knowledge is more. But not every professor I had believed that. They may have believed it, they didn't teach it. But 
One of the things that when I introduce you to a book, first thing I want you to know is I want you to know right off the bat how many chapters in the book. Could be a gate question. I want you to know how many chapters in the book. You know how many chapters in the book of James? We'll look them up. Look them up. Count the chapters. Because we're going to walk through this book, not in one night, but in one year. Right? How many? Uh, got five. All right, I want you to do something else. The second thing you should look at is how many, how many verses are in the book? Look, how many verses in the book? Now, you could cheat. I gave you Cliff Note version. You could cheat and look on the paper. Right? Say. Now, I never, I never considered Cliff Notes a cheating. Okay? But for those who la glanced on your paper, I just wanted to see if you knew it, if you'd look them up and count them. Now, I put that number down, so if you know anything about numbers in me, you'll go count them again to make sure my numbers are right. <clears throat> I laugh that, you know, they say that uh, they want to have an easy tax form. My first question was, does it involve math? Because that wouldn't be easy for me, so <clears throat> anyhow. If my calculation is right, there's 108. Now, I'm going to show you why this is important. I'll show you why this is important. Because <clears throat> when you look when you look at the number of verses in each one, here's what's interesting, and this is important to the study of the book. Chapters 1 and 2 have nearly as many verses as chapters 3, 4, and 5. In other words, you can almost divide that book in half. The first half of the book is chapters 1 and 2, and the second half of the book is chapters 3, 4, and 5. Now, what did I learn from that? Here's what I learned from that. Just, just that simple exercise. I learned that whatever, he, whatever doctrinal principles he's loading up on chapters 1 and 2, he's explaining them for application for life in chapters 3, 4, and 5. And if you want to know, if you want to know how, the, how James writes his book, I just told you. And therefore, every week you should read through the whole book of James. Only 108 verses, come on. You can do that through commercials. You watch two programs, you can read that much through commercials. See, just that little simple exercise, it shows me that he's teaching the heavy stuff in chapter 1 and the practical stuff. He's teaching the doctrinal principles in 1 and 2 and teaching the practical principles of 3, 4, and 5. And that is the book of James, by the way. So that kind of stuff is, is kind of important, and, and it just gives you clue, a clue of some simple ways to look at something and get a heads up. And this is going to be true uh, for a lot of the books of the New Testament. In Ryrie, Ryrie does something interesting in, in, in Ryrie's New American Standard Version of, of his book of the Bible. He takes the 27 chapters of the New Testament and he divides them in four parts. And this is kind of interesting what he does. Uh, the English Bible takes the 27 books of the New Testament and he divides them in four sections. He calls them the history books and he means by that messianic history. He calls the first section, that's the four gospels and the book of Acts, he calls history. That means, and he means messianic history. Then what he does, what he does in, uh, next to that is he takes this thing and he goes to J uh, Paul's epistles. That's 13. You know, Paul wrote 13 letters. He goes to the Pauline epistles. These are letters to the church. He gets, so he, he breaks down messianic history and then 
the epistles of Paul to the church. And do you know who Paul was an apostle to in the church? Gentiles. And the rest of the apostles were toward the Jews. James was an apostle to the Jews. Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. And therefore, he writes 13 books that are primarily oriented, primarily oriented to Gentile believers who are sweeping the world with the gospel of Christ. We sat here in this group of people. Gentile believers, listen, you'll never find any pastor, Gentile pastors, pastor in Gentile churches that doesn't love Paul's epistles and teach them all the time. <clears throat> but that's interesting how he breaks that down. Then he does, the next thing he does in his, he calls the, he calls eight books, the next eight books, he calls general epistles. And that's kind of interesting. And by general epistles, he means epistles that are going out in a general way to reach everybody's audience. For example, when you've got the Gospels and Acts, your primary Jewish believers, and introducing the church in the disp and the transitional period from the Jewish age to the church age. Paul comes in and he writes all these books to Gentile churches and so you got a pretty good balance going on here. Then there's what we call the general epistles. And, and these are, and later you'll see, these are James, Hebrews, Jude, First and Second Peter, the three Johns. They call, he calls those general epistles. And, and that's pretty good, even though we know, for example, in the general epistles, some of these, for example, John 2 and 3 were written to individuals. You know, but he puts them in general because of where they were going out. They were going out both to the Jewish church, Christian church, as well as the Gentile Christian church. And then he, he, he says the final one is Revelation, and he uses that. That's the book of Revelation. So it's kind of interesting the way he breaks that down. And it's interesting to us because he puts James into the general epistles. And James says that himself. James says that he wrote his book to the 12 tribes. Now, you and I both know there are no 12 tribes, right, that James is writing to, right? Because 10 of them are gone until the second coming of Christ, right, as far as fact. And it's going to be interesting how I teach you today is going to be interesting why he calls it writing to the 12 tribes of Israel. We know that his book is going to be heavily Jewish oriented, just like Paul's was heavily Gentile oriented, right? Now, we know that because he tells you this. But he's writing to the 12 tribes. James knows there's not literally 12 tribes. Ten of them have gone out to Assyria, but he still writes to them and knows that. So that, this is going to be an interesting point as we look into the discussion more of this. Here's point number two. Point number two is the way I introduced my lesson to you. In a way to examine the book, there are five chapters with 108 verses, and it's important for you to understand that the first two chapters, were, he's going to pound down some really good, solid doctrinal principles and then he's going to show, show you how they should be practical in your everyday life in chapters 3, 4, and 5. So you'll want to pay attention to that as we walk through this book because we're going to heavily emphasize that. Here's point number three. The date of the book of James is also very interesting. Somewhere around 45. Somewhere around 45. We know this for sure. It wasn't 49 or 50, because that's the Jerusalem Conference, and this book is part of that. And I'll tell you why in a moment. Many theologians that believe that it's 45, 46, 47, somewhere in there, uh, I'm going to stick with 45. It was written about the same time James writes his book to the Jews the, Jew, the Jewish believers at the same time, about the same time that Paul is writing 
to the Gentiles the book of Galatians. Now, when you, and listen, this is really important. When you take these two books and put them down and pull them down and read them side to side, it's really interesting what's going on. I can't tell you how important that is. Now, I wrote it out of your paper because it could be a gate question, so I need to have you prepared. Both of these New Testament books are definitely written before the Jerusalem Conference. And I can tell you why, absolutely 100%. I can tell you why. I can tell you why, because at the Jerusalem Conference, late 49, early 50 A.D., and we know that date's pretty locked in. There was an apostolic decree agreed on between the Jewish church and the Gentile church uh, apostolic decree. It was written and hand carried to all the churches, both Jewish Christian churches as well as Gentile churches. That's very, very important. This is really important. So I want you to go to the book of Acts with me and let's take a look at this decree. We have looked at this decree before, but maybe not everybody because. We all go, you know, you go to, this church goes on different days. Now, this, at this in Acts 15, this thing is going to, I'm going to start with verse 13, because James is the pastor of the Jerusalem church, the apostle pastor, and he's the guy who is going to, after the committee has gotten together and laid this out, he's going to bring what the apostles have agreed on. It's called the apostolic, it's not called a creed, it's the apostolic degree, decree. James, that's verse 13. Brethren, listen to me. Simeon, that's Peter, has related how God first concerned himself about, ha ha about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. That's, that's Acts 10 and 11. And, uh, uh, and with this word of the prophets agree, just as it is written, and then he starts quoting Old Testament. After this, I return, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. I will rebuild his ruins, I will restore it, in order that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, saith the Lord, who makes these things known from, from of old. You know what he just said? He said, when, Christ, when the Messiah comes, when Christ comes, then the messianic prophecies are going to be fulfilled. You know what they didn't understand until after the resurrection, ascension, and session of Jesus Christ, how to distinguish these, and now they're getting the point. They're getting the point that when Old Testament talks about the coming of Christ, it talks about one coming of Christ, which is both him going to the cross, going back to the Father, coming again in the second advent. You've got to understand that when you're quoting Old Testament scripture like this. And so that's what, that's what James is talking about, the coming of Christ and what it means as far as the Messianic age. Therefore, it is my judgment because Christ has come. There's no doubt that Jesus is the Christ, the Messianic Savior of the world. And when he comes, then his kingdom is going to be established. Now, they're struggling about the first and second coming. They're still struggling with it. It's really early in the church. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them because it was apostolic that, that the Jew would be a light to the Gentiles through Christ. It's now clicking. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they abstain from things contained by idols, from uh, fornication, and for what is strangled for blood. In other words, if there are certain things in the law because they're still there. They're still struggling. Listen, James and the Jewish church is struggling because the Jewish age is still operational. See, this is in the 40s. God is not going to take that whole system out until 70 AD. That's really important. You understand that. And they're struggling with this transitional period. Of, of Jewish age out, church age in, old covenant out, new covenant in, uh, Levitical priesthood out, uh, the, uh, the priesthood of Christ in. They're struggling with this. 
that's understandable. They're struggling with it. God is going to make it real easy by se after 70 AD to get rid of this. Now, there were good signs of this because the veil of the temple was taken down at the death of Christ, right? The veil of the temple. So there ought to be some heads up on this, but they're struggling with it, all right? And then verse 21. And so they're trying to make some kind of appeasement between the Jewish church and the Gentile church. And so they've come to an agreement about what would be the, the worst thing that you could do as a Gentile in regard to a Jew that would be offensive. And so we're talking about the law of love here. And, we're, but, and, and so they're still struggling with this transitional period. And they're going to struggle with it all the way through the book of Acts. You know, the book of Acts only covers 30 years. And that's a magnificent 30 years because by the end of the book of Acts, the church is established and we're under a new covenant and things are really moving forward in light speed. In 30 years, just think of that. Just think of all the changes that had to be done in Israel in 30 years. And when you add up those 30 years, you're, at, you're in the very early of the 60s. James and both James and Paul are going to die before the 70 A.D., James is going to die a martyr's death in 62, and Paul's going to die a martyr's death in 68. Neither of them are going to see the Jewish system just out of business. And so you've got to keep some of this history in mind as these guys struggle through this. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preached him since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. You know what the, you know what the synagogue was to the Jew? It was home Bible studies to the church. It came out of the Babylonian captivity. They didn't have a temple. What do you do when you don't have a temple system? You hold to the doctrinal teaching. Uh, a synagogue was an assembly of believers to gather to study the, doct the important doctrines of, the, of uh, the Jewish age. Some of them were good, some of them weren't. Depends how, how, how deep they got into the law without Christ. Listen, if you had a synagogue that taught the law without Christ, and that was a majority of them did, then you had an apostate synagogue. But if you had a synagogue that taught the coming of Christ, which some of them did because we have Anna, we have Zechariah, we have Jesus and all those kind of people, that's a whole different ballgame. Well, anyhow, then it seemed good to us. It seemed good to the apostles and the elders. That's the church conference. With the whole church to choose men from among them, uh, to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Ju uh, Judas and Barnabas and Silas, leading men among the brethren. And here, is the, and here is the decree. And they sent this letter by them. The apostles and the brethren who are elders to the brethren in Antioch, Syria, and, and uh, Sicilia, who are from the Gentiles, greetings. Since we have heard that some of our number to whom we gave no instructions have disturbed you with words unsettling to your souls, it seems good to us, having become of one mind, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have sent Judas along, along with Silas, who themselves will also report the same thing by the, by the word of mouth. For it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than, the, than these essentials, that you have saved from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourself free from these things, you will do well. Farewell. That's the apostolic decree. This was, this was bigger than life to settle some of the issues between the Jewish church and the, and the Gentile church. If this... If this letter had been written after the Jewish conference, there would have been note of this. Neither one of them noted. it. And that's really important to dating this, the, this, these two books, Galatians and uh, James. We believe, we believe this because neither James nor Paul are going to mention this apostolic decree written from the Jerusalem conference that they were all to read. This was... This was the way to settle some of this hot-button issues between the law and grace. Like, 
you know, you're familiar with Acts. They, the, there was this section of Jews that said, listen, listen, we believe that you have to be circumcised. You have to believe the gospel and be circumcised in order to be saved. That's in the first, listen, that's, that's, that's verse 1. That's how you got saved. And then in verse 5, how, how are you, how, would, how do you become spiritual? You've got to keep the law. You've got to have the Holy Spirit and the law. Well, they settled that out saying, no, no, your, salva your salvation is this way and spirituality this way. In verse 11, they talk about the grace principle on both of these issues. So this is really important. It's well worth your read um, because they were having problems. And they listen, Galatians, the second chapter, remember when Peter came and the conflict they had? This was before the Jerusalem conference. They, that, because of those conflicts between both of these, that thing was tried to be settled to try to make some kind of peace agreement within the groups because we still have the Jewish age, even though it's in a transitional phase, it's being old covenant phased out, new covenant brought in, Jewish age out, church age in, all of this. That's the book of Acts is a transitional period. Here's the fourth thing. James 2.2. 2. I want you to look at James 2.2 2 for a moment. If you can get, go back out of the book of Acts and go over to James with me. Second chapter, verse 2. James gives you a, a James gives you one view. Paul would have never gave you this view. But James does. And this is an important view. It shows you where James, and of course, James is ministering to Jewish believers. That's his congregation. And, and he's in this, the sin of partiality, if you have a study Bible. And I'm looking at verse 2 because I'm looking at the word assembly. If a man comes into your assembly, you know what he's talking about? He's talking about synagogue. He's talking about assembly. It's, it's a synagogue. That's what he means by the word assembly. He's talking about, he's talking about synagogue. Now, Paul would, wouldn't talk that way unless he was going to talk to a Jewish audience. He would call that a church. Ecclesia, he would call that a church. Ecclesia is a group called out to gather, to, a, a, a people who are called out to gather together, placed together, people called out of the world to assemble together. Just interesting. It's, I'm just giving you high, highlights of this. If a man comes into the assembly, this correlates with what James talks about in Acts 15.21 at the Jerusalem conference when he says, for Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him since he is read in the synagogue every Sabbath. That's part of James' sermon. All of this is very interesting when you begin to look at this stuff. The book of Acts the book of James and the book of Galatians shows that the law and rituals were still being practiced by Jewish believers until 70 AD. If you study those three books, you will see that that was an issue. It was going on, and they were trying to find some common ground between the Jewish church and the Gentile church. We know that in Matthew 27, 50, and 51, it's a big deal now. In Matthew 27, verses 50 and 51, when Jesus dies on that cross, he says, Teleestai, to Teleestai, in the perfect passive indicative, it is finished. Salvation is completed. Anybody who wants it can come by grace and get it. Right? The gospel. The gospel is now about to be formed. 
He dies on a cross. He's buried. Three days later, raised from the dead, and we have the gospel according to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. That gospel in Romans 1, 16 has now become the power of God to save everyone who believes it. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Paul says, everybody is saved by grace through faith and not of himself is a gift of God, not of works. They stay in a man's boast. When he says it's finished, the veil of the temple that separated the holy, holy from the holy place, the holy of holies was the key deal that is rent from bottom to, bo top to bottom. The sanctuary, the sanctuary, the sanctuary, the holies of holies where atonement became shadow Christology. Christ on the cross became that, that substance of reality of that, of that shadow Christology. Behold, the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. It was the Lamb of God on the cross for the Jew to see that took away his sin. It would be no longer the animal. And so they would not go back to practice it. He tore it down and no man dared to ever put it back up. Because that tabernacle became the temple and that came from a pattern from heaven. Book of Hebrews. And so the entire deal was done. At Pentecost, the sanctuary that was done away with the death of Christ is now introduced as the Christian believer's body. The holies of holies, the sanctuary of God is a Christian's body. 1 Corinthians the sixth chapter, 19 and 20. What, don't you know that your body has become the temple, the naos, the holies of holies of God? Because the Holy Spirit dwells there, the third member of the God. Godhead dwells inside your body, and he is there, John 14, 16, forever. That's a long time. Today, we think if you've connected with somebody for 50 years, that's a long time. That veil is done. Therefore, the atonement work, that whole system has now been shifted away from shadow Christology into historical Christology. Agreed? And that was the major picture of the whole redemptive system of the, the Levitical system. Now it's a matter of just winding it down. It's now a matter of shifting out in the transitional period of the book of Acts. That's the book of Acts. Shifting out of Old Covenant, New Covenant, Jewish age, priest age, uh, Levitical priesthood, uh, priesthood of Jesus Christ, the royal priesthood, the holy priesthood, just the shifting out. And they're struggling, the early church, with it because everything's up and... Listen, everything was up and running except the holies of holies, which was the whole gut of the whole thing. <laughs> James was struggling with grace during the transitional period of the church age. We can see it all, all the way up to, the, listen, from 30 A.D. to 50 A.D., James is struggling with it. The Jewish church is struggling. Paul is over here preaching grace, and the Jewish church is having problems with it. James was struggling with grace during the transitional period, and Paul was struggling with the law. We know that from Acts 21. Acts 21. 
the most unbelievable thing was when Paul, in Acts 21, you know who encouraged him to do the purification vow of the law? Purification, man. Do you know who convinced him he ought to do that? James. In Acts 21, it was James. Paul knew better than that. Paul knew that the whole Levitical system, purification, the whole system was kaput. You need to go back and read that passage. James is struggling with grace, and Paul is struggling with law. You can see his struggle in Romans 9 through 11. Oh, how I love the Jewish people. Oh, I could give my life for them. You don't give your life. One life has already been given, Paul. You don't give your life. Jesus Christ gave his life. But they're struggling. And listen, if you've come out of an apostate system of religion who has downplayed grace and upplayed works for spirituality and salvation, then you know the struggle these men are going through. It's tough to get out of one system and into another one. It's certainly difficult to leave works and come into grace. And buddy, you need to do it. You need to cut yourself loose from that law and that work system. To think that by works you're spiritual, by works you gain the approbation of God. Nothing could be farther from the absolute truth. That's apostasy. We live in the day of grace. Go back and read Acts 21. It'll be well worth your time. And listen, here's the point. You know what we're talking about? You know what your great struggles in life with? Oh, man, thinking. The Word of God will tell you, don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together. And so what does a whole large group of people that used to go to this church do? They forsake the assembly and think they're okay. They think they're okay. You know, it's not okay because the body of Christ has not changed and will not change till it's raptured out of the world. It is still local. It is the church at Ephesus. It's the church at Birmingham. Why would you listen to all that craziness that you can set someplace and live in la-la land when the reality is you need to be in a local church? Your gift is needed. Your ministry is needed. Your money is needed. Your ministry absolute out is important. You know, I'm being constantly pulled towards a computer ministry. It will never happen. I've gone as far in that direction as I can possibly go. For me, being on the Internet is a ministry. It's not a church. This is a church. This is called the assembly. The only assembly there's going to be universally is the rapture. Every time, everything else. Listen, do you live in La La? Listen, you've got a mailing address. If I want to get in touch with you, I have to find a mailing address or a phone number that's local. It's either got an address, Trustful or someplace, or Pell City, and a zip code. And if I want to call you on the phone, i got to have an area code. You know what that is? That's a local. This idea that you can sit in la la la, unless you're in heaven... You need to be next to it. You need to be in a doctrinal church that teaches the truth of the Word of God and grace. If you live, I used to say, in a 40 mile radius, Bill corrected me, in a 42 mile radius. Thank you, Bill. You need to be here on Sunday. And if you can't make it on Sunday, come on Tuesday. If you can't make it on Tuesday, make it on Wednesday. And if you can't make it on any of those, put six people together and I'll come to your house. Why six? Because I'm not going to drive you to your house if you can drive to mine. That's car load. <laughs> 
They've shrunk the cars, cars so I don't know that six is a car load anymore, is it? it? Used to be when we shifted and had a front seat. Well, I'm telling you where my heart is. I, I listen. I'm convinced, John Dyer's convinced me there's a great ministry out there on the Internet. But let me tell you, under my ministry, there's never a day when I consider you my church. You want to be part of my church? Move to Birmingham, Alabama. We got work here. The other day, I heard a guy say, we're crying for workers. We'll pay him $34 an hour. I thought, $34 an hour? You need a job? Go downtown, find out. Anywhere from $12 to $34. I don't know if that's a good wage or not. I haven't worked for wages in so long, I have no idea. You know what James pushes? He pushes keeping the law. You know what that is? Saved by grace, spiritual by works. You got to pay attention when you read them. That's why everybody uses his book and goes all over the place. Point number five. The book of James was addressed to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. Who are these dispersed called the 12? I can tell you, first of all, it's not a verb. Sounds like a verb, doesn't it? It's not a verb. It's a prepositional phrase. Who are in the transition. Who are in the disbursement. There's no verb in that. In that. It's a prepositional phrase. It's in plus the locative, for those who are in the Greek language, it's in plus the locative place who are involved in the disbursement. It's interesting that Paul also mentions the 12 tribes. He mentions them in Acts 26 when he's talking to King Agrippa. He says, King Agrippa, I know you're a man of the scriptures. You know why both these men mentioned the 12 tribes? Because both of them are going to come back with the coming of Christ. Right? Listen, are the 12 tribes going to come back in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the second coming of Christ? Of course they are. Did they know the difference when they, when they read the Old Testament? Did they know the difference between the first and the second coming? No, they didn't. He's talking to King Agrippa. You know the scriptures. You know when Christ comes, the 12 tribes are going to be important. That's James. The 12 tribes are going to be important because Christ has come. That's why they're talking about this. Paul talks about the 12 tribes in his defense in court with King Agrippa. Well worth your read in Acts 26 on your paper. We know 10 of these tribes actually, literally, were under the fifth cycle of divine discipline to Assyria in 722 B.C. We know there's some place in the world, according to 2 uh, King 17 and won't be back until the coming of Christ. We understand that to mean the second coming of Christ where the 12 tribes will be important because in the book of Revelation, the 12 tribes, uh, 12,000 from each of the tribe is going to make up the 144,000. Ha, 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 right? Even though the 12 tribes are a little mixed up and you have to understand because there's a little bit of history involved. Oh, I can't study that. That's history. And so we don't pay any attention to that. But if you say the 144,000 that are going to come back, the tribulation due to the second coming of Christ, and 12,000 out of every tribe, they go like, oh, yeah. But they don't pay any attention to the, the listing of the 12 tribes. I'm telling you because we've looked at this. We know that they will not be reunited until the coming of Christ, Revelation 7, Revelation 14, and Revelation 21. I put all these references on your paper for study. With the coming of Christ, there is a renewed nationalism of reunion of the 12 tribes. You can see this in Luke, the second chapter 36 with Anna. You can see it in Luke 22, 30. Even this is true today. Is there not nationalism? Is there not a, a, a reunion of, of Jews from all over the world coming back? And you know, listen to me, listen to me, don't get crazy. Do you know, you remember Anna? In the temple, Anna, do you know what tribe she was from? Tribe Pam's from. Asher. Yeah? 
the phrase is. And, and isn't she uh, cut off the rug? She's a very active person in the temple, in the assembly. Those ashers. She, listen, she boasts that she's from the tribe of Asher. And she connected all this holding baby Jesus. She went, thank you, God. I, from the tribe of Asher, has seen the coming of the Lord. Do you have any idea the thrill that went through her soul? I mean, it probably popped her toenails. I mean, that was an exciting moment in her life. She was from the tribe of Asher, and these tribes have been coming back. They will be reassembled for the coming of the Lord. James is writing to the 12 tribes. Paul is talking about the 12 tribes to King Agrippa because they both understand the coming of the Lord will bring the tribes back in a unified way. They just don't know the difference between the first coming and second coming yet. Listen, can I pause just a moment and tell you what a privilege it is for you and I to sit in a doctrinal church where we know this stuff today and can separate all this stuff out. Think how smart you are. I mean, I just think, God, how was it that a little kid from Podunk, Michigan could know this? How is that possible? I mean, God, that's just mind-boggling. I didn't get this from seminary. I got this out of the pages of the Word of God. I sent her to good pastors, just like you. Somebody that's just dogging the Word of God to get every, every ounce of importance out of it I can get. We also know that Jewish believers of James' ministry were being persecuted by their own religious leaders, and part of his point is of the disbursement is they are now being dispersed out. He has no idea, listen to me, he has no idea how bad this disbursement, because he's talking about Acts 8.1. You know who was part of persecuting the Jew at that point? Listen to me. <laughs> you know who was persecuting James's church at this point? Saul of Tarsus. In the early days of the church that James was part of, the great persecutor of the church that was sending his congregation out of their nation was a guy called Saul of Tarsus that he's having a meeting with 20 years later at the Jerusalem conference, and this man is talking about Jesus Christ and the grace of God. Tell me a miracle can't happen in a person's life. There he stands before James and gives this enormous message about the grace of God. As a pastor teacher, James is writing to encourage Jewish believers under persecution for their Christian faith. We call it undeserved suffering. James is writing to encourage them to apply the revealed truth of the Word of God residing in their soul by the faith cycle. He's going to establish it in chapters 1 and 2 and teach it in chapters 3, 4, and 5 in practical theology. James is going to teach us in James 2, 17 and 26. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead by itself. What we don't know is just how much James understood other than the practical application of that truth. But I can tell you this and make no, dis no dispute about it. Faith by itself has no merit. James said that. He says dead. It must have a trustworthy object, working object to do its work. Trustworthy object to do its work. That is the word of God, whether it's the gospel, 
like in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 with Romans 1, 16, or the word of God applied to your daily life. That's the absolute truth about faith. Okay? So, as far as I can get today, let's have a word of prayer. The men will take the offering. We'll take a 15-minute break. Listen, what I said to you today applies to my church. It doesn't apply to any other pastors. How you want to run your church is your business. Don't think I, my way is the highway. But for me and my pastorate, this is the way I pastor. I want, I've got to have face-to-face -face people. When we assemble, it's not, to, it's not just to teach people that don't come. It's to teach people that do come. If I show up here one day and there's all, all I have is empty pews, Yeah, there you go. Okay. I got enough empty pews as it is because we're not bringing in the sheep. Father, we thank you for this opportunity today to speak the truth of the word of God, at least the way we view it based on the scriptures that we've studied, and we pray, Father, others would study it for themselves. I pray today, Father, as we begin to look at the James, the book of James, we, we're just trying to set the, what is going on historically, trying to put numbers and dates and places and people in the picture so that we get into the book of James, we can be a little more understandable about what's going on in 45 A.D. in the early church. Pray, Father, for the offering today that would be good stewards of it, spend it on getting the gospel out and the needs and the missionary work around the world that we're engaged with. For we've made this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.